<laughs> Why would I do that? <laughs> Five eight versus six seven. That was fine. Yeah. Uh, our guest via telephone is Delegate Michael Height. Good morning, Michael. How are you? Good morning, gentlemen. So, uh, what are you supposed to get out of there by what Saturday, Sunday this weekend? Uh, Saturday. So five days left. Saturday is the last day. Um, and usually on that last day, we work right up till midnight trying to get as uh, many bills uh, passed as possible. So we'll be running back and forth with the Senate and, and trying to get a bunch of work done. Mike Hyde is the assistant majority whip out of the 92nd. He also sits on committees such as finance, health and human resources, political subdivisions, uh, senior children and family issues, technology and infrastructure, too. And is your position on finance that I'd like to ask you about this situation with nearly a half a billion bucks in the federal government. We talked to uh, Larry Cumb about this in the previous segment, but he thought you might have more details on this. Mike, what exactly is the issue with the money and how w how well West Virginia spent it or didn't spend it appropriately? Well, so here's my understanding of it, which, you know, probably isn't the best, but here's, here's how it was explained to me. There was approximately 460 $465 million um, that was given in ARPA funds um, from the federal government, and it was directed straight down to the counties. Um, so it was sort of the state was sort of like a pass-through, and the money was given out to the counties. And there, uh, uh, of course, all, with all money that comes from the federal government, there comes rules. So they sent out a list of this is how you have to spend the money. But the problem was a week later they sent out another list and said, actually, this is, this is how you have to spend the money. Uh, and then the following week they sent out another list saying, well, actually, this is how you're supposed to spend the money. So this happened nine times in 11 weeks. So I don't know how you can follow the rules um, if you have nine different sets of rules in 11 weeks. So the counties had trouble uh, staying within the rules, I guess, uh, according to the federal government. And now they're saying that uh, some of it wasn't spent properly um, to the tune of $465 million. So um, they're, they're asking for the money back um, as a clawback. Um, from what I understand, um, the, the governor's office told him to pound sand. That wasn't going to happen. Um, but that in an effort to try to uh, be conciliatory, we would, we would try to spend that amount of money on education um, in, in this fiscal year. So that's where it, it's, it's messing with our budget right now and, and money we wanted to direct in other areas. We're trying to pull money to the tune of $465 million from other areas and, and plug it into education. A lot of that stuff was already going to go to education anyway, so um, it, it, that's sort of what's going on right now. Mike, you said they changed the rules a lot. This is Jonathan, by the way. You said they uh, they changed the rules a lot. Did other states have the same issue and that, that we're having? Are there other states where their school boards you know, didn't understand and, and – are they asking to, to claw back money from other states? Uh, yeah, as I understand it, this has happened to 40-some other states as well. I don't, I don't know which ones followed all the rules, um, but it was a, a very small uh, segment of states that uh, aren't having this issue right now. Is there an appeals process in some way to go back and prove that you did follow the rules given when they were given out over those nine or 11 weeks and nine rule changes? With the federal government? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> thought there had to be an appeals process somewhere, right? Yeah. Sure, yeah. They say you didn't follow the rules. Um, Which set said, of well, rules? Yeah, but we did, and it's like, yeah, no, you didn't. Okay, so yeah, well, that's what I, that's what our argument was. Well, which set of rules? And and they were like, we don't want to hear it. You know, here's the here's the good thing. Okay, the federal government doesn't truly want the money back. They're not they're not really truly asking us to cut a check for 465 million dollars back to the federal government. They they essentially don't want the money back. They just want us to spend that amount of money in a certain way. So as long as we sh show that we have spent it in a certain way, they're fine with it. 
What, can we ask what is that certain way? I mean, what what was not if the money was given through the state to county school boards, the county school boards had to have used it in the education funding in some way. What what is the specific way that they now want it to be spent? Yeah, I I don't know. Um, I do know that um, we have the state has offered this is how we're going to spend it um, and they have accepted those those different ways and one of them is teacher raises one of them is teacher retirement so different things um, towards education in different areas um, they have accepted as, as satisfactory so I don't know how it was spent to begin with and, and why was why that wasn't acceptable um, Right now, everybody around here is in crisis mode, so you don't get a whole lot of answers. You get the the rough draft, so, which is a sort sort of what I'm giving you. <laughs> yeah, you're right. which is okay. That's, but but you, you mentioned then possibility of teacher pay raises, and yet I, I thought I read an article that those may be something that don't end up in the budget right now, waiting to figure out what's going to happen with this 465 million. So is that more of a guarantee they will be in there? Well, I think that I think there will be teacher pay raises, and don't don't quote me on this. But I think there will be teacher pay raises in the budget because of this. Um, I just don't know if it will be the across the board, all state employee raises like what the governor originally um, wanted to do. Um, that may come. Later on, we've talked about a special session maybe in May and coming back and seeing what we have as far as uh, supplemental income at the end of the year to um, be able to plug into some of these holes. But um, as it stands right now, I, I, am, I am fairly certain that the, the teachers will see some kind of increase. Will that include service personnel as well, do you know? I, I really don't know. Okay. I, uh, everything is so up in the air right now. It, it's hard to tell. Hey, you got a week to figure it out, or less. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> or yeah. less. Isn't that, isn't that great, Mike? <laughs> has does the House have? Uh, a, I think it's as I, I think I read it was in the Education Committee, but I'm not sure. The travel ball bill from Senator Amy Grady, which would allow students to play travel ball and high school ball in the same athletic season. Have you uh, read that bill? Uh, yeah, yeah. That's stupid. I don't even want to talk about that. What else? <laughs> so, so, no, your, your your friend Hornby was in favor of it. Uh, you were opposed yeah, to it. Whatever. I mean, he he's an education nut. He gets involved in all that stuff. Some of that stuff that comes out of education is just ridiculous. I don't, you know, I don't want to talk. You know what? You know, let's talk about something well, that, that good happened for Berkeley. Well, County. well don't go well, don't go there don't, just yet because I, I've got a, a co-host here who called sports play by play in high school and college ball for thirty years, sir. And I, I wanted to get a couple questions in here. Well, no, yeah. My only question to that. That is, I remember back in the day where um, I, I believe it was, you know, muscleman volleyball and going deep into the playoffs and, you know, young ladies that wanted to participate in travel ball could not try out because it would have nullified their opportunity to continue to play going into the state tournament. Is that something that at least could come out of this bill that says you, you may not play volleyball for a travel team and your high school team during the same season that I think would be way too much. These athletes have enough on their plate already, but certainly it would give them that opportunity that they could participate in at least a tryout to know that they're going to be on a team. Um, you know, I, I don't disagree. Here's, here's my opinion. And I, my, actually, I don't think this bill's going to run. It won't see the light of day. So I don't think it's a sort of a non issue. But my opinion on the situation is why the heck is the state getting involved in this? Why, why can't students and parents decide whether or not they want to play travel ball and high school ball at the same time? Why, why are schools preventing that at all? You know what? If if you don't like it, you know, don't don't put them on your team. Now that's, that's a regulation my, through the SSAC, though, correct? Well, uh, yeah, yeah, right. Which we need to dissolve anyway. You know, that's the most <laughs> ridiculous organization we have in West Virginia. Preach it. Well, I mean, yeah. I, but that I was the, from, the Amy Grady bill basically was saying parents should have the right to decide what their kid wants to do athletically. Well, and I can see you're from an absolutely right, but it won't see the light of day. It, this will not pass this year. All right. Well, I can see from an educational standpoint that kids would do better if they're playing school ball and travel ball because that way they're practicing and having games seven days a week. So, I mean, they're doing their homework at 2 in the morning. That makes sense educationally. 
Sure, absolutely. <laughs> now, but, you... but but kids kids are are doing all kinds of they're they're playing you know rec center they're playing the same sport all year long they're you know this this sports thing has gotten out of control with kids mm, but you know I what agree. yes let, sir let the, let the parents and the kids figure it out i don't know why the state needs to get involved we don't need to be a nanny state all the time well i guess senator grady feels the state needs to get involved because the ssac right now is prohibiting it from being a parent's child decision well then senator grady's bill needs to be to dissolve the wvssac well, you'll get support in this room from at least two votes, I can tell you that. Uh, three. Three votes. And while we're at it, let's dissolve the NCAA. Hey, I'm, let's, let's go for it. Now, what, you said you want to talk about something good for Berkeley County. Go right ahead. Yes, yeah, something good for Berkeley County happened yesterday. Um, we, were, we had a, a bill about impact fees in Berkeley County um, that came over from the Senate. There was a companion bill here. I ran myself here on the House side. Um, that did away with uh, the the requirement for zoning for impact fees, um, and the, the the bill over on the Senate side, um, Summer Barrett worked really really hard to get passed over there, and um, it passed through the Senate. The House bill sort of died over here in Gov Org. We just couldn't get the the um, the chair to run it over here. He sees it as a increase in taxes, and he was not for it at all. Um, but then the Senate bill passed in the Senate and came over here, and, of course, it went straight to GovOrg. Um, and, you know, Mike Hornby and myself worked hard um, badgering, I mean literally badgering, um, the, the chair of GovOrg. Um, and I, I think he finally relented and put it on the, the agenda. Um, and once it was on the agenda, Summer came in and, and – uh, finished it off and and got the uh the caucus to to vote it out so it will be on the house floor on first reading today um and you know delegate hornby and i are also trying to whip the rest of the 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 caucus in uh in the house to make sure that uh we get at least 51 votes and get that that passed this year that's huge for berkeley county it, it, it was huge uh big team effort um you know kudos to to Summer Barrett for she really worked it on the Senate side, came over and, and made sure it, it, it got passed over here on the House side once it got on the agenda. So, um, you know, a big win for all of us down here. You keep congratulating Summer Barrett. You're going to give Ken Matz and high blood pressure. <laughs> yeah, I know, but Ken has no idea what people do down here. So, um, I'll I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> now, Mike, again, this is specifically for Berkeley County? Well, so the the if you look at how the code is written, um, you have to be a growth county in order to be able to impose impact fees in any way, even with the zoning. So there's only one or two counties that are growth counties right now. Um, you, you have Berkeley. You could have maybe Putnam. I would think Mon County is probably close. Um, but isn't there yet? But there's there's other criteria you have to meet before you could impose impact fees, even before um, with the zoning. So uh, this right now is basically a, a Berkeley County bill. You mentioned the governor chair didn't want to run it because he viewed it as a tax increase bill, which effectively yeah. it is. It's a it's a tax on new home construction in some situations and cases. Summer, yeah. Summer pointed out the specifics of it in an interview, I think, uh, last week or so. Uh, how yeah. did, how were you able to convince the GovOrg chairman that he's not going to get, or she, I'm not sure who the chairman is, uh, blamed for a tax increase if this goes through? Well, you know, I'm going to give uh, Summer some credit again for that. She convinced him that this was, because it was uh, only affected Berkeley County, it wouldn't affect any of the other counties uh, in the state unless they became growth counties and then they would be for it as well. Um, in the end, I think he relented because it wasn't going to affect his county or, or a lot of the other counties. And you have to look at the makeup of GovOrg as well. This is the majority of, of the people in GovOrg are, are the southern uh, part of the state, from the southern part of the state, with the exa exception of, of like uh, Delegate McGeehan, who's from the Northern Panhandle, but the majority of that, the makeup of that 
committee um, is Southern West Virginia. So they always ask, you know, how is this going to affect us um, and our county? So I think once Summer convinced them that it wasn't going to affect their counties, uh, they relented. Some, uh, Davy Jones uh, wrote, uh, will this raise home prices? Because the builder, I'm sure, will pass it on. The answer to that is yes, it will raise home prices. And yes, the builder does pass it on. And I know this for a fact because about 20 years ago, Frederick County, Maryland passed impact fees. And the immediate impact was in, in our area was about a ten to fourteen thousand dollar increase in the price of homes. Now, at sure. the time, the average home was selling for two fifty three hundred. Now, the average home was selling for six to eight hundred thousand dollars. So that ten thousand dollar increase got swallowed up along the the price of appreciation mm -hmm. a long time ago. Right, and well, uh, what you also have to think about is it's not just the home prices, but what is the impact to the county when you have five or ten thousand people moving in every couple of years. Um, kids going to schools, uh, the effect on the roads, the, the effect on the fire and EMS, that that, that impact is felt almost immediately um, to the county, but yet the real estate uh, income doesn't catch up for, for, you know, two or three years. And, and I know Bill has talked about this, you know, before as well. Um, this is just something that I think uh, growth counties almost have to have to be able to um, infrastructurally keep up with growth. Mike, you just mentioned those services. Does this bill state that this increase or this now, um, I guess, presentation of an impact fee that wasn't being collected in Berkeley County, does it have to go towards those specific types of services? No, there's no language in it. That, that So the, the bill itself only strikes out the section of code where it pertains to zoning as a requirement. So everything else that was already currently in code is still there. Um, it, it, you just don't have to have zoning anymore. And there are, there's, if you look at the code, there's a whole list of requirements that you have to go through, that the county would have to go through before they could implement um, the impact fee as well. All those are still in place. Um, just not the zoning. And, and then it comes down to this is, you know, we, we get back to local control. This is, this is for the, the county has some control over what, what happens and what the impact fee is, and, and they can work with the local contractors and everything to figure that out. Speaking of local control, control Mike, I presume that there is no appetite for county home rule in this session. Uh, no, not in this session. It, 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 uh, it sort of died. You're, and, and that, the, everybody looked at that as a tax increase as well. And it is, I mean, to a degree, but the way the bill was written is it was up to the individuals on, at the local level of whether or not they wanted to be taxed because it, you had to have a referendum to do it. Um, so, but still there were, there were enough people that did not want to run that in an, an election year and that's just politics right now yeah, that's how that goes so i intend to run it again next year we'll see what happens you're ready to lean into your mic john i am hey i got a question we were talking with your uh fellow delegate uh mr comp a little while ago about vaccines and the vaccine bill what uh what sort of thoughts do you have on that mike didn't you uh, didn't you talk about that enough in the previous segment? <laughs> you got it. <laughs> Damn. Can I say don't tell me? No. Hide the heckler. <laughs> you know, so here here's the deal. That particular piece of legislation I have struggled with more than any other piece of legislation down here. Um, and the reason is I see I see an individual's right to not have a foreign substance pumped into their child's body. I, I understand that, um, aside from the religious exemption and all the other stuff. I, I see that. Well, why should the state mandate that you put a foreign substance into your child's body? So that's one side of it. I also see where our Constitution says that the function of government is for uh, the common good and welfare of its citizens. 
Um, so you have to take that constitutional aspect of it as well. So there, in, in my opinion, there's some constitutional conflict um, when it comes to vaccines. In the end, I think vaccines are good and they keep our, uh, our community healthy, um, especially the ones that have had years and years of study and, and we have seen the results of them. Um, I, I do not see the same thing with things like the COVID vaccine, the flu vaccine, those types of things, um, where they only, uh, they don't prevent the disease, they only make it uh, not as bad, if you will. Um, to me, those aren't true vaccines. Um, a vaccine, in my opinion, is something that eliminates a, a disease from happening, like the polio vaccine. If you are vaccinated for polio, you just don't get polio. Um, so I see the need for those for the common good. I got, a I, I got no follow-up on that because I agree 100% with you, Mike. Thank you. I got a text from Dr. McLaughlin during the conversation we had with Delegate Kump toward the end of it. And in regards to the bill that passed the House, he wrote, Ask if they're wrong and kids die. Is the state going to compensate the families? Well, so the families will be the ones who have made the choice not to vaccinate. So why would I compensate somebody that made a choice not to vaccinate their child? Because that's not true. You're assuming that just that child, but there are children who can't get vaccinated. And there are people who lose their immunity to it, as uh, the infectious disease specialist from WVU pointed out, if you go through chemo chemotherapy, uh, you are in a large chunk of our Listen, population does you are I, you are now susceptible to that virus i i don't disagree with you and trust me i can play both sides of this issue because i have mm -hmm. and it like i said before it was the most difficult vote i have ever taken down here because i it just because i see the side where um just because you can't get the vaccine doesn't mean I should have to put a foreign substance into my child. I understand that argument. I also understand the argument of this is for the common welfare of our community, and if it's not done, innocent people will die. Mm -hmm. So in the end, I, I voted for the community and the innocent people who could not die. That doesn't mean I don't recognize the fact that, as a parent, I should not have to inject a foreign substance into my child's body. So I, I am very conflicted with this. Trust me. Yeah, I think we all are, Mike. Yeah, all we of all us are. as parents, we, we all had that same moment to make that decision when our kids were born. And uh, no matter how much you are conflicted over it, uh, the person beside you is wrestling with the same thing, I'm sure. Yeah, and, and trust me, I'm not an anti-vaxxer. Even if this were not mandated by the government, I would still vaccinate my kids. So I, I see the benefits of vaccinations. And on that note, anything that we didn't cover that you wanted to make sure we did before we let you get on with your day, sir? Um, well, there's another big issue that happened yesterday. I know we don't have a whole lot of time, so I won't go into it very deep, but another big thing that happened in uh, finance, there's a bill that came over from the Senate um, to change the unemployment law um, yes. slightly. So um, that, that's going to get a lot of news, a lot of headlines in the coming days. Um, and, you know, whether or not it passes, I don't know. It's pretty controversial, so... Um, it's, but it's going to be a big deal. Yeah, you guys were discussing this a little bit last year, and it's got a, a few more legs this year. And this, in regards to, it, it ties unemployment to the state's economy and reduces the number of weeks. Yeah, I think it we it it would have been much um, much more uh, a, a bigger uh, bill if it had not been for 
the massive layoffs we just saw with uh, American Wood Products mm-hmm. um, uh, here recently, and and you're going to see you know hundreds, if not thousands, of of individuals um, go on unemployment because of that. So timing and optics, obviously, this is politics again, um, aren't great, and there's some people that just won't vote for it now because of that, and and those are their areas. So. Uh, I think they may have been a yes before, and they're definitely a no now. So um, this, what was proposed yesterday, uh, may be as close as we can get to any uh, any change at all. Mike, thanks so much for your time this morning. Hey, thank you, gentlemen. Good to talk with you. Thanks, Michael. Mike. Height.